Hey guys, we're here for episode 18 of the e-commerce opportunity where I'm joined by Colin. Colin, how are you, my friend? I'm good, man. How about you? Doing well, thanks, dude. I'm really pumped to finally have you here. There's a lot I know about you, but there's even more I want to know about you, hence why we're here. So do you mind starting by sharing kind of what you're working on? Yeah, dude. So um, essentially what me and my team are working on right now is um, I started, I, I co-founded a company called Boomin uh, with uh, two other guys. And essentially uh, we have pivoted the traditional agency model. Uh, and really it was a planned evolution more so than in a pivot, but both, both pivoted and evolved the traditional agency into being essentially a, a CPG uh, direct-to-consumer e-commerce uh, brand portfolio. So uh, we currently operate 11 brands, um, everything from hunting backpacks and beauty all the way to food and beverage. Um, so uh, essentially what, what, what we work on every day is uh, we build, grow, and scale uh, direct-to-consumer e-commerce brands. I love that. And I really want to dive into the, the business model in a second because I know what you're doing there is really interesting. Um, but what were you working on prior and, and what was it that gave you like the interest or the confidence to kind of go out in your, on your own and start this agency and this business? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, truly, the, the story actually starts all the way back in college. Um, I started to sell T-shirts on the Internet, followed by iPhone charging cables, followed by you know, early iPhone accessories. And we had like the big square plug, not like the lightning uh, cord that that we know today. Um, and, you know, really, truthfully, I actually started screen printing t-shirts at a local print shop um, on campus at Illinois State University. That was the first place I were uh, screen printed. And then um, I'd actually started to find people that now it's called print on demand, but there was no printful, there was no Guten, there was no print on demand. And so I actually got started really early um, sourcing products in China shipping them to the United States, um, creating a brand or a store um, and, and running um, you know, digital advertising to sell those products, everything from uh, t-shirts and hats um, all the way to imported products from China. And so that was, uh, you know, I started really getting into that uh, quite heavier into like 2012, 2013, and eventually ended up founding a company called ViralCard. It was a holdings company that I used to um, uh, own uh, the e-commerce brands that I was starting. And basically, I would build these like business in a box. I would get an e-commerce brand with a stable product to about seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars in revenue. My goal was always to get it to forty grand in profit, and then try and flip that brand as essentially like a uh, like a business in a box. So I was doing a lot of like um, micro acquisitions. Um, and so, uh, or, or, you know, having people micro acquire um, the brands that I was starting um, and, you know, did that a couple of times and, and realized that, um, you know, being a one man band and being in that hustle mode was something that, you know, I didn't really want to, that I didn't really want to do. And I didn't have the necessary capital to go to the next level. And so um, the idea was to use other people's money uh, OPM for the people that are familiar with it to build a highly specialized team that could incubate, grow, scale brand, you know, e-commerce brands profitably. Um, and so that's what we did. We started an agency um, and essentially, um, you know, used other people's money and hired, you know, highly specialized people in addition to myself and, and business partners and um, to build it, to build and scale a team. And then from there, essentially decided to pivot the business into, um, you know, doing really unique deal structures. So we operate the business on, uh, three different revenue, uh, models. Number one is through, uh, royalty. So we will operate uh, company a, um, on a royalty basis. So we enter an agreement where we're taking a percentage of revenue. Um, of net revenue, not net profit, not profit, but we operate the business on a revenue basis. So we do everything from customer service, marketing. And when I'm talking about marketing, I'm talking about email marketing. You know, uh, we, we have a content production team here in LA. We have, uh, you know, of course, all the media buyers, email and SMS, influencer marketing, social media management, you know, a five-person design team, uh, you know, web website designers and developers, 
Uh, we've got a team of, of 30 plus uh, doing everything from fulfillment vendor management, meaning managing the fulfillment vendor, managing inventory, managing all returns, all customer operations uh, and customer service, as well as all the marketing uh, side of things. And so um, we essentially will plug in our team, enter into a strategic partnership where we plug in our team in exchange for a, for a royalty uh, fee. So we will operate the business on a royalty fee. The, the number one easiest thing, way that this clicks for people oftentimes is when I refer to Shark Tank, where someone pitches their business and they're saying, you know, I want $100,000 for 10% of my business, which is a $1 million valuation. And, um, you know, then Mr. Wonderful Kevin goes, you know, I'm willing to give you the, the $100,000, but instead of 10% of your company, I want a 1.5% royalty for uh, 20 years or until, or, or, you know, $3 million or something like that, right? And it's a good way to keep all of 100% of your company and control the finances, the voting and, and, and all of that, but then partner with someone who can give you either the financial capital or the human, a highly specialized human capital to grow your business, right? And so that, that's revenue model number one uh, is, is through you know, strategic partnerships on a royalty basis. The, the second way that we operate is through, um, is through uh, basically incubating our own brand. So we will build a brand from the ground up. Um, the most recent example of this is um, our uh, gourmet condiments and sauce company uh, called Zesty. Uh, basically, what we did was, you know, we worked with manufacturers, we developed the product, um, and we will, you know, personally fund the manufacturing and build the and build the business from the ground up. And then the third way is through acquisition. We mostly operate in the micro acquisition space, um, so we're looking to acquire brands um, that do in between about a hundred to uh, $500,000 a year profitably, um, and or if it's not profitable at, a, at an annual basis, um, there was at least periods in there where there was profitable traction. Um, and so then we'll acquire those companies and plug them into what we're doing. Wow, there's a, there's a lot here. So to kind of recap, so it sounds like you have 11 brands in you know, all three of those buckets, is that total? So, so where do most of brands live? Is it mainly right now on, on like the royalty rev share side and kind of moving towards like the internal and, and kind of own brands and acquisitions? Like where are you now and where are you going? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so we've actually began to, to blend the models actually a little bit, uh, which makes it another degree of confusing. So essentially the, the, the I'll, I'll answer that, but to give a little bit more context so people understand what I'm answer, it's, our long-term vision of Boomin is to own and operate an e-commerce portfolio that does $200 million in e-commerce revenue annually, okay? That was, when we started Boomin, we said by the end of year five, we want to have produced $200 million annually. Now, by any means necessary, okay? So what we did was we started on a royalty basis, but now we're actually taking the brands that really, that we really evolved, uh, you know, uh, uh, have had a lot of success with, and we evolve those relationships. We invest capital and we actually take equity. So it's about 50, 50, it's about 50% royalty basis, 50% equity and, and royalty. Um, transparently though, you know, I'm, I'm always about transparently uh, uh, about transparency, the way that we did this, was we planned um, halfway through 2019 to pivot the business to basically actually fire or part ways with lots of our royalty and agency clients and take the money that we had made in 2020 to build our brands. So after 2019, what actually ended up happening was 2020 hits. Um, I'm in Bali for the month of January. I come back and it's COVID and e-commerce just absolutely skyrockets and um, manufacturing, product sourcing, all of the things that we needed to do in order to get our own brands off the ground were no longer available to us. So we made you know, lemonade out of lemons and just really began to scale the royalty brands that we had in front of us and, and you know, take things to the next level there. So um, we're only two or three brands technically into incubating and acquisitions um, of the 11. 
Um, we should have one close in the next like 60 days that would technically be 12. Um, and so it's about 50, 50 to answer your question. That's awesome, dude. This stuff is fascinating. So I want to focus on, on zesty, right? So condiments, sauces, spices, uh, why, why that sector, why that industry, how long did it take to develop products? When did you launch? How's it going? Can you break down this business? Like what was the thought process? Where are you yeah. at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've been doing this, I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years, um, uh, longer than 10 years. You know what I mean? Like I started painting houses and selling things online and, you know, uh, promoting like, you know, throwing events, ticketed events, you know, for a long time. <clears throat> and one of the things that I learned across the, the, the landscape is number one, you can either do things for passion or you could do things for, um, the opportunity to make profit, right? You, passion or opportunity. Those the two things. And, um, Really, I have no passion for sauce, although I do love to dunk a good nugget and, 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 and or some pizza and some ranch. Um, I have, I'm, I'm not at all passionate about sauce. Truly, the, the main goal is to create a liquidity event in the business, meaning that we operate this business for a profit, but then I can actually sell one of the assets that my company operates for a big, for, for a large chunk of money. And I'm not doing this for the sale. I'm not building the company for the sale, but that's actually how I started. I would love to run Zesty until, you know, the day I, you know, kick, kick the can, you know what I mean? Like until the day I, you know, retire or, you know what I mean? Like I have no plan of selling it right now. I'm not building the business to sell it because I think that's important, but really what I work backwards from is I wanted to create a liquidity event and I wanted to create a disruptor brand. There's not very many categories available right now that's open for disruption, like what Casper did to mattresses, right? Uh, what Dollar Shave Club did to razors, right? There, like, if you actually look at it, there's almost a, a major category player in the in the in the D to C space, in the direct to consumer space, for every product category. Almost, there's not very many left. Um, you know, you could argue that Truff. Um, you know, is, is a category disruptor in DTC for hot sauce, but, you know, I think they have like a mayo and a marinara sauce like that, you know, maybe totally have 10 SKUs. Um, there's no major, major, major direct consumer household brand name that would have an opportunity to get acquired by a Procter and Gamble, to get acquired by a Johnson, to get acquired by a major CPG brand. And so I actually started the idea of what categories are open. For, for disruption. That was, that was uh, the number one reason why I wanted to do this. Uh, number two was what categories are open for disruption that don't include software or hardware? That limited it down quite a bit. What categories are, are open for disruption that is going to take me $100,000 or less in startup capital to get to day one, right? Products in warehouse ready to ship, content shot, you know, everything that limited it down quite a bit. And, you know, I was actually left with an idea that I've actually uh, been sitting on for, for two years. And that was uh, gourmet condiments that have wild and extraordinary flavors that you can't buy in store, right? Stuff that's, you know, you can buy, you know, cranch, ketchup ranch and buffalo ranch and avocado ranch in the store. But what about roasted crushed garlic and habanero peppers, right? And what about, you know, a barbecue sauce made with real hand smoked chipotle peppers, like actually putting chipotle peppers on a smoker instead of, you know, artificial smoke, you know, smoke flavoring. How can I deliver a product that you can't buy in store so that I can be successful with D2C? And so that, that's actually what Zesty is. So over the last, you know, year and a half or so, Basically, what I did was, you know, we we developed these flavors. I, you know, developed relationships with manufacturers and decided to build Zesty, which is a um, ultra premium condiments sauce. We we call it a flavor company. We we actually sell seasoning. We sell barbecue sauces, ranches, hot sauces. None of our stuff, none of our hot sauces are extremely hot. They're just packed with tons of unique flavor. And then we use real food ingredients. One of the things that you know, as a part of the the you know the the the, the maker story was that we realized that almost everything you buy in store, none of it actually has 
real anything in it. It's, you know, concentrates and powders and artificial flavorings and dyes and all of these things that, um, you know, I just personally think shouldn't be in food. And so then that kind of made it in into the story as well. So now we have wild, extraordinary flavors that you can't buy in store that are just totally inventive and unique and euphoric, right? Bringing food to a whole new level by adding flavor to it. That's also made with real food and not, you know, artificial flavorings and the stuff, you know, and, and we do use some binding agents, um, but no thickeners. Like why, why does your sauce look so perfectly thick? It's because there's stuff in there that makes it look like that, right? Uh, we use binding agents. So the stuff doesn't separate and look too nasty, but you know, we don't add tons of those things because I think that stuff shouldn't be in there at all. I wish it would, it could, it wouldn't be in there altogether, but you know, that's how we develop the product. Then, then essentially, once we developed the product line and we had the products, I actually handed it off to my team to actually name it, name all of the flavors that I developed uh, with the manufacturers and, and bring the brand to life. Um, so that's, that's really the story of Zesty and, and, and why we did that. I love that. And how long ago did you launch and what's kind of been the initial traction or reaction? Yeah, I think we launched like 15 days ago. Uh, I think it was like two weeks ago on Thursday. So maybe 13 days in, I believe. Um, it, it was, I think it was April 29th, actually, now that I think about it. Um, but I think we launched on April 29th, soft launch, friends and family. I think we've done about 500 orders overall. Um, feedback is incredible. Um, so part of the stuff that we're doing is giving you a wild experience that, you know, you just won't get anywhere else. And so this is how you're, you know, this is how it shows up, right? Like your party flavors have arrived. Um, it's a wild box. Um, we have, you know, each and every single one of our uh, products has individual artwork for, for all of them. And so this is, this has been, you know, we, we include a sticker pack, you know, and all of them. And so the whole goal was to launch soft to friends and family to get the product in people's hands, because we knew that as soon as people saw our box and saw our product and, you know, read the flavors and tasted, tasted it, that it was going to be unlike anything they've ever done before. And so what we did was we did a soft launch to friends and family, and we outreached to a bunch of influencers. And right now we have more content pouring in from and, and, and great reviews, positive experiences, word of mouth that like we're running no ads, doing no email or no SMS right now. We're kind of just in the, in the building phase, putting content together, shooting stuff um, at our at our studio here in L.A. and and, you know, putting things together for the brand. So really, really, really early days of the brand. But you know, the, the goal is to get this to about a hundred thousand dollar a month run rate pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah, dude, that's, that's brilliant. I actually ordered some product. I think at some point a week or two ago, I think it's going to be here any second. So I cannot wait to create some content and try it. And I'll definitely let you know how it is. So thank you thank for, you. for, for I appreciate walking through it. that. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah, absolutely, dude. I appreciate the support. Of course. No, always, always trying to support you and anyone else I can. So that's great. Um, so question, you mentioned before, right? You wanted to start something sub 100K to go from idea to, to launch. Um, what are some other things that are important to you? Like what traction metrics, you know, how, how do you know if you're working on the right thing is essentially what I'm asking. Like with a bunch of other businesses and opportunities, how do you know if Zesty is the right one? How much time do you give it? How much money do you spend? What are some of the metrics that you look at to be like, man, this is a winner, let's double down. Or unfortunately, this wasn't a winner. Let's pivot to something else. Yeah. So great, great question. I, I, I'm personally of the belief system that um, bad products with good marketing makes it, you know, can, can be successful and, and can be a successful company and good products with bad marketing, um, can be successful or, or, you know, or will, will not be successful. Um, it really all comes down to like sales cures all. And at the end of the day, if you're running a company, and you know you you do a million dollars in revenue and you make a profit on that um you know it's working and so my, my belief system is that i believe in these products i know that this is a good concept am i 100 percent sure that my price point is correct am i 100 percent sure that 
you know, being a 100% direct consumer brand is the right move. Will Amazon be a major player in it? You know, I'm willing to explore that. Will brick and mortar end up being, you know, a good revenue generator for us? Should we be doing that? Is our pricing not right? Do, you know, do we need to, um, you know, change or alter the products? Will I have some bad products and need to drop them or reinvent them or just remove them altogether? Yes, I'm sure I will. But the answer is, there's no way this won't work. And there's no way that any idea that you have shouldn't work. So as long as that it's a good concept and that you have good marketing and that it, 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 it fills a gap. I know for sure with a hundred percent certainty that there's a major market out there for hot sauces, unique, expensive hot sauces. I know that there's a major market out there for ranch dressing. I know that there's a major market for barbecue sauce. I know that there's a major market for, for seasoning, right? Like it gets bought in store every day. Can, can I crack the code of having good enough marketing to be successful? And at the end of the day, I don't care if I can, you know, our goal, you know, transparently is to reach a hundred thousand dollars a month in run rate at a three MBR, meaning that, you know, we're, we're doing probably about 20 to $30,000 a month in profit. Okay. Now, if I can do that for 12 months, you know, I'm going to be in a really good spot, you know, $30,000 a month for 12 months is, you know, not a little bit of, it's not a lot of money, but it's not a little bit of money. Now, where can I take it in year two? Where can I take it in year three? And what if the brand has a, you know, 24 month EBITDA of, you know, a few million dollars? Well, you know, if I'm not in love with the brand and I don't want to run it anymore, then that's a great grounds for, a, you know, a good acquisition. Um, so, that's, you know, it's just, it's just like, I'm not married to the product. I'm married to the idea of getting this to like, I'm, I'm married to the idea of making the most out of the opportunity, which in my opinion is possible no matter what. Yeah, dude, I, I love that. And I'm the type of guy that every single time I go to the grocery store, my wife says, do not buy more hot sauces, do not buy more seasonings. So every single time I go, I want to buy something new. And we have all these seasonings, these sauces that like, I never use, but they look cool. And whenever people come around, it's like, oh, Chase, you're the sauce guy, you're the seasoning guy. So I am your customer and, you know, pending the product's good, which I know it's going to be great. I'm going to be buying from you probably on a monthly, if not quarterly basis. There we go. I'd love that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the biggest thing is like, how much money will you put into this? I will put as much money into it as, as is needed. You know, if I fail and need to restart five times, then, you know what I mean? If you get knocked down five times, you're going to get up six. You know, it sounds corny, but um, that's just the, the truth and the reality is like, you know, if there's a wall, you have to climb it. If the wall keeps getting taller, you better be better at climbing. You know what I mean? So Yeah, I love that. I got a couple more questions. The first one I want to yeah. talk about is like, when you think about, you know, boom and kind of what you've built, right? You started as an agency, you're kind of moving towards this hybrid model of um, having some skin in the game with some clients and also building, buying your, your own businesses. How do you think about like your guys' revenue forecasts over the years? Do you think a lot of the revenue is going to come from kind of what you're already doing on the, let's say the services side, or do you think a lot more of the revenue as a percent is going to come from these internal brands? Like how do you foresee those two kind of contributing to your bottom line? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So um, truthfully, the way that I see Boomin is we started an agency and we diversified the revenue streams, right? And now we use that same team to operate our own brands. Now, what will happen is the original entity will probably move up to being a parent company or a holdings company to Boomin Brands and Boomin Services. Boomin Brands will own Zesty LLC, okay? And so the, the royalty revenue, to be completely honest with you, it's all of the money with very little of the headache of running a business. Like you'd have to be, we, I'd have to be out of my mind and have so much good stuff cooking up on the brand side and need my team so much for the brand side that, you know, I would be making a very silly financial decision to stop doing any of the royalty work that we are doing. Um, at the end of the day, royalty revenue, um, you know, is, is going to be classified as a services business. Um, you know, selling your agency or creating a liquidation event in your agency um, is, you know, 
it's atypical, number one, doesn't happen often. Number two, it has to be really special. Number three, oftentimes you're just not going to get the numbers. It's more so a lifestyle business. It's a way to create cash flow and funds to do other things that, you know, it, that you have, you know, that you can have more control of and you can create liquidity events in your life. So, you know, ultimately the, the idea is for, you know, boom in services to always do what it is doing and, and continue and going to continue to scale and grow the royalty and equity deals that we have in place. Right. Because why would I invest, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into brands that I run on a royalty basis to buy equity, if I'm going to walk away from that deal, it's an absolutely stupid move. Right. I want to control my own success there. I, you know, I don't want to trust someone else to do that. And so we're going to continue to grow that, but our main priority right now for growth, like, like for growth on the team side is with our own brands, but really our number one priority as a company right now is continue to scale and grow the royalty, you know, companies that we operate to continue to be the absolute best partner that we can be to, you know, our strategic partnership brands. Um, you know, the money's good. The money is really good. You know, you do, you know, on track to do probably about 80 million this year. It's not a little bit of money, you know? Yeah, it's, that's huge. And, and congrats. That's, that's super awesome. Um, on the, the team side, you mentioned before, I think, give or take about 30 people. How do you find people and how do you recruit people? I know a couple of people that have come to work for you recently, really smart, really good people. How do you find these people, right? Like, are you recruiting yeah. them? Are they coming to you? What platforms are you using? You know, how much does your yeah. guys' agency reputation come to play, personal brand come to play? Like, what, what is the secret? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, and I'm super transparent about everything and, and more and more and more so recently, you know, I've shared this tip with a lot of people, including, you know, including Shackleford and, 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 you know, um, your, and, and your crew and a lot of others. So, you know, and, and I'm not afraid to do it, but more so I'm getting more and more and more skeptical to give people this secret uh, because I'm starting to see a lot of other people do this on the platforms that I like to play in. And it's becoming harder and harder and harder. So the number one thing is we're a remote team. So I need someone who, number one, can effectively work remote. Number two, I need them to be a self-starter. I need them to be hungry and like actually want to wake up and solve problems and get out there and put things on their plate and finish them. And you know, I need them to be a self-starter. I need them to be proactive. One of the hardest parts about building an, an effective team is, you know, you could hire someone with an MBA and, you know, 10 years agency experience, which I have. And, you know, they're just not the person that puts things in play and, and wins every day and every week and every month and every quarter. And really what I think those people are, is they're, that's the entrepreneur in you. That's the, can I do whatever it takes to, to get the job done, right? And the best way that I've found these people is actually through hiring on, on freelance and contract work platforms like um, Upwork, freelancer.com, and actually posting a job and saying like, this is, you know, a full, full-time role, like Monday through Friday, 95 with highly competitive pay. Um, and interviewing for people that are email marketers, media buyers, designers, content creators, you know, web developers, all, you know, all the things that you would need. I like to hire on, on a platform where people don't get a salary job and it's actually kind of a sale. So I don't talk about hiring. I'm recruiting. Like when you switch the mentality from I'm hiring to I'm recruiting, that puts the onus from they're coming to me to I'm finding them and I'm putting them on my team. Right. That like, it's like recruiting an all-star team, you know, a college, you know, college athletics. Right. It's like, you got to put the best team in place. You have to go to them sometimes, right? And you got to find the atypical ones, right? And so, you know, some of my best employees, um, you know, I'm 99% sure, but, you know, I, I won't put his name out there, but a lot of people know who he is. Like you would know his name if I said it from like the Facebook ad buyers group and just, you know, being a legend of the space. He didn't even graduate from high school. That didn't matter to me. 
You know what I mean? Like fuck a college degree. You didn't even graduate from high school. You know, one of, one of the hardest marketers in the game, you know what I mean? Graduated from what we were doing and, and you know, left to go do his own thing. Um, and, you know, you found that that person, the self started the people that can get it done, hiring on an Upwork or an Elance or a freelancer.com, you know, those types of platforms where people are actively trying to seek out more work. Like I have three clients, I have a full-time job, but I'm looking for more. You know what I mean? Like I actively want to solve your problems. Like I want clients to hire me to solve problems for them. Right. Those are the people that I'm looking for. Killer, man. I'm, I'm so fired up with the energy and even just the concept. So I love that. The final question today, I'm super appreciative of you, you being here and all the, the knowledge. Um, in terms of like the, the agency side, the services side, like the royalty, the rough share side, how have you found those clients, right? Like most people, when they're getting clients, they think about, you know, a flat retainer. And, and a lot of times that's what we charge and what we do, right? And, yeah. and those clients typically come to us and there, there's a lot of those types of clients. But to find like the right client that actually wants to do the model that you have and understands it and is on board, like how, how does that start? Like, how do you find those people? Are you friends with them? Do they come to you through referrals? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, you know, I really wish I had a better, better answer for this question. I get, I get asked it a lot. Um, and it, it sounds almost arrogant and, you know, I, I almost apologize for that, but the answer is like, you know, if you've been, you know, I started doing this in 2010, you know, like I started, that was 11 years ago. So when you do something for 11 years and when you do something for three, four five years, right. And it's something super new, you know, I was the Facebook ads guy. I was the e-commerce guy. You know what I mean? Like I went to networking events and talked to people that owned a lot of different businesses. I was the only one there that did e-commerce. And over time, you know, I started doing phone consulting and advising. I started, you know, investing in certain things. And, and over time I created, you know, my relationships with uh, Nick, which is how I know you with, uh, you know, most big players in, in the e-commerce space. Like I know a lot of them. And if I don't know them on a personal basis, I'm at least like social media friends with them. Like, you know, I know who they are. They, you know, know of me, you know, I know of them, they know of me, you know, we've gone back and forth on social media. I've spoken at a ton of events, speaking at events, you know, for the last five, six years is a game changer. You know, I met my business partner, Ryan, speaking at collision conference in Vegas, you know, in 2015, 2016, whenever that was, um, you know, it's, it's like the answer to that question is, unfortunately, everyone really comes to me. It's, it's like, hey, I have a friend. They tell their friend about like, my friend Colin has been doing e-commerce for years. And then, you know, we started the agency. We did the traditional model. We had tons of success under our belt. And when we decided it was time to pivot, the conversation was, hey, we're killing it for you. We're either going to walk away from you. Like we don't want your 15 grand a month. Now we're going for a hundred grand a month. We want to operate your business with you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like not for you, with you. Um, and so we turned a lot of our traditional agency clients into, um, you know, royalty uh, clients. We also, you know, have been blessed to be introduced to lots of different people. Um, and really, I would probably say like, we probably get in between like, on average, probably five leads a week and, you know, 52 weeks in the year, you know, we get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, like, you know, 99.9% of people we talk to, we refer elsewhere. And there's the point one where it's like, this is a good opportunity. I'm interested in it. Um, you know, we've never done any outbound sales ever before. It's like our reputation precedes us, fortunately, for the work that we've been able to do. Uh, you know, taking brands from, you know, 10, 15 grand a month to, you know, millions of dollars a month, multiple, not just doing it once, we're doing multiple, 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 multiple times. And me telling you about it and me telling other people about it and them knowing that it's real and me doing stuff like this opens up the conversations um, to other people, you know? Man, Colin, massive way to end it. This was incredible. Thank you so much for, for being here. I know how busy Absolutely. you are. Uh, what's the best way for people to work with you, work for you, learn from you, connect with you, uh, whatever yeah. it might be? What are some of the best ways? 
Yeah, um, great question. We're always hiring talented people. So if you're a social media manager, a content creator, an editor, a designer, you know, web developer, um, anyone that you know thinks that they can play a major role, customer service operations, like you know, fulfillment vendor management, manufacturing. At this point in time, we're hiring um, great people all the time. So if you think that you can play a major role in what we're doing, um, you know, reach out to me. Uh, probably the best place to find me and the place where I'm most active, because I'm quite inactive on all social media, it would be Instagram. Um, it's at Colin Magoo, M-C-G-O-O. -O. Although my name is Colin McGuire, you can search that too. I think you'd be able to find me. Um, but yeah, reach out to me on Instagram. I'm also happy to give feedback. I give feedback to people all the time. Uh, you know, people message me, hey, what do you think about this product? Hey, what do you think about this landing page? Hey, I'm trying to sell my company or, you know, thinking about selling my e-commerce company. Like, you know, what, what, you know, should I think about? I'm also open to acquisition conversations all the time. You know, you have a brand that's doing, you know, a hundred to $750,000 a year. You know, I'm open to that conversation. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, reach out to me. I, I'd love to talk to anyone that's, uh, that's watching this. Amazing, Colin. I'll drop your IG. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you and have a, a good rest of your day. Absolutely, man. You too. Be easy. All right, cheers.